Chapter 31 Home for the girl, the old man and the despairing cat was a pleasant but very average looking stone and timber cottage situated in a broad grass-covered clearing sheltered by centuries old oak and red elm. Porches ran along the front and rear of the cottage and the walls were grown thick with flowering vines and bush evergreens. Stone walkways ran from the home through gardens that lay all about. Some flowers, some vegetable all carefully tended and neatly drawn. Spruce and pine lined the perimeter of the clearing, and the hedgerows ran along the borders of the gardens. A great amount of work had gone into the care and nurture of the entire gardens. The same care was evident inside the cottage, neat and spotlessly clean. The sanded wood plank floors and timbered wall gleamed in the soft light of the oil lamps, polished and wax. Handcrafts of woven cloth and cross-stitch hung from the walls, and bright tapestries draped the rough wooden furniture and windows. Odd pieces of silver and crystal sat upon tables within a broad shell touch, and the long trestle table at one end of the main room had been set with earthenware dishes and crafted utensils. Flowers blossomed from the vases and clay pots, some grown from planting, some cut and rearranged. The whole of the cottage seemed bright and cheerful, even with a nightfall, and there was that feeling of a veil home at every turn. Dinner is almost ready, Kimber announced when they had come inside, casting a reproachful glance at Cogline's direction. If you will see yourselves, I will put it on the table. Grumbling to himself, Cogline slid onto the bench at the far side of the table, while Bryn and Roan sat down across from him. Whisper padded past them to a braided throw rug situated in the front of a wide stone fireplace where a small stack of logs burned cheerfully. With a yawn, the cat curled before the flame and fell asleep. The meal that Kimberbo brought to them consisted of wild fowl, garden vegetables, fresh baked breads, and goat's milk, and they consumed it hungrily. As they ate, the girl asked them questions of the Southland and its people. Eager to hear of the world beyond her valley home. She had never been outside Darkland Reach, she explained. But someday soon now, she would make that journey. Goggleine scowled his disapproval, but said nothing. His head lowered an unyielding concentration on his plate. When dinner was finished, he rose with a sullen grunt and announced that he was going out for a smoke. He stalked through the door without a glance back at any of them and disappeared. You really mustn't mind him, Kimba apologised, rising to clear the dishes from the table. He is very gentle and sweet, but he has lived alone for so many years that he finds it difficult to be comfortable with other people. Smiling, she removed the dishes from the table and returned with a container of burgundy-coloured wine. Pouring a small amount into fresh glasses, she resumed her seat across from them, as they sipped at the wine and charred amiably, Bryn found herself wondering as she had wandered on and off from the first moment that she had laid eyes on the girl, how it was that she and the old man had managed to survive alone in this wilderness. Of course, there was the cat, but nevertheless. Grandfather walks every evening before dinner, Kimber Bow was relating, a reassuring look directed to the two who sat from across her. He wanders about the valley a good deal. When the late fall comes, all of our work is done for the year, and when winter comes, he will not go out as much. His body hurts him sometimes in the cold weather, and he prefers the fire. But now, while the nights are still warm, he likes to walk. Kimba, where are your parents? Bryn asked, unable to help herself. Why are you here all alone? My parents were killed, the girl explained matter-of-factly. I was just a child when Cogline found me, hidden in some bedding where the, where the caravan had camped the last night at the north edge of the valley. He brought me to his house and raised me as his, as his granddaughter. She leaned forward. He has never had a family of his own, you see. I'm all he has. How were your parents killed? Rowan wanted to know, seeing that the girl did not mind speaking of it. No, Raiders. Several families were travelling in the caravan. Everyone was killed except me. They missed me, Cogland says. She smiled. 
but that's been a long time ago. Rowan sipped at his wine. Kind of dangerous here for you, isn't it? She looked puzzled. Dangerous? Sure, wilderness all around, wild animals, raiders, whatever. Aren't you a little afraid of sometimes living alone out here? She cocked her head slightly. Do you think I should be? The Highlander glanced at Bryn. Well, I don't know. She stood up. Watch this. Almost faster than his eye could follow. The girl had a long knife in her hand, whipping it past his head, flinging it the length of the room. It buried itself with a thud and a tiny black circle drawn on a timber in the far corner. Timberbow grinned. I practiced that all the time. I learned to throw the knife by the time I was ten. Cogline taught me. I am just as good with almost any other weapon you might care to name. I can run faster than anything that lives in Darkland Reach. Mm, except for Whisper. I can walk all day and all night without sleeping. She sat down again. Of course, Whisper would protect me against anything that threatened me. So I don't have much to worry about. She smiled. Besides, nothing really dangerous ever comes into Hearthstone. Cogline has lived here all his life. The valley belongs to him. Everyone knows that. They don't bother him. Even the spider gnomes stay out. She paused. Do you know about the spider gnomes? They shook their heads. The girl leaned forward. They creep along the ground and up trees, all hairy and crooked, just like spiders. Once they tried to come into the valley about three years ago, several dozen of them came, all blackened with ash and anxious to hunt. They're not like the other gnomes, you know, because they burrow and trap like spiders. Anyway, they came down into Hearthstone. I think they wanted it for their own. Grandfather knew about it right away, just as he always seems to know when something dangerous is about. He took Whisper with him and they ambushed the spider gnomes at the north end of the valley right by the big rock. The spider gnomes are still running. She grinned broadly, pleased with the story. Bryn and Rome cast uneasy glances at each other, less sure there than ever what to make of this girl. Where did the cat come from? Rome glanced again at Whisper who continued to sleep undisturbed. How does he disappear like that when he's so confounded big? Whisper is a more cat, the girl explained. Most such cats live in the swamps in the deep and are, well, east of Darkland Reach and the Raven's Horn. Whisper wandered into Olden Moor, though, when he was still a baby. Gogline found him and brought him here. He had been in fight with something and was all cut up. We took care of him and he stayed with us. I learned to talk with him. She looked at Bryn. But not like you do. Not singing to him like that. Can you teach me to do that, Bryn? Bryn shook her head gently. I don't think so, Kimber. The wish song was something I was born with. Wish song? The girl repeated the word. That's very pretty. There was a momentary silence. So... How does he disappear the way he does? Roan asked once again. No, he doesn't disappear, Kimber Bo explained with a laugh. Just seems that way. The reason you can't see him sometimes is not because he isn't there, which he plainly is, but because he can change his body colouring to blend in with the forest, the trees, the rocks, the ground, whatever. He blends it in so well that he can't be seen if you don't know how to look for him. After you've been around him long enough, you learn how to look for him properly, she paused. Of course, if he doesn't wish to be found, then he probably won't be. That's part of his defence. It's become quite a game with Grandfather. Whisper disappears and refuses to show himself until Grandfather has yelled him himself hoarse. Not very fair of him, really, because Grandfather's eyes aren't as good as they used to be. But he comes for you, I gather. Always. He thinks I am his mother. I nursed him and cared for him when he was first brought back here. We're so close now that it's as if parts of, we're part of, of the same person. Most of the time, we even seem to be able to sense what each other is thinking. He looks dangerous to me, Roan stared flatly. Oh, he is, the girl agreed. Very dangerous, wild. He would be uncontrollable, but Whisper is no longer wild. 
There may be a small part of them that still is, a memory or, or an instinct buried deep inside somewhere, but it's all but forgotten now. She rose and poured them back each a bit more of the wine. Do you like our home? She asked them after a moment. Very much, Bryn replied. The girl smiled, obviously pleased. And I did most of the decorations myself, except for the glass and silver things. They were bought by Grandfather from his trips. Or well, some he had before I came, but the rest I did. And the gardens, I planted those, all the flowers and shrubs and vegetables, all the small bushes and vines. I like the colours and the sweet smells. Bryn smiled too. Kimberbo was a mixture of child and woman. In some ways she, she was still young and some grown beyond her years. It was strange, but she reminded the Valga of year. Thinking of it made her miss her brother terribly. Kimberbo saw the look that crossed her face and mistook it. And it really isn't that dangerous here at Hearthstone, she assured the Val girl. may seem that way to you because you are not familiar with the country as I am. But this is my home. Remember, this is where I grew up. Grandfather taught me when I was little what I should know in order to protect myself. I have learned to deal with what dangers there are. I know how to avoid them. And I have Grandfather on Whisper. You don't have to be worried about me. Really, you don't. And Bryn smiled at the assurance. I can see that I don't, Kimber. I can see that you are very capable. To her surprise, Kimber Bow blushed. Then hurriedly the girl stood up and walked to where Cogline had dropped his forest cloak on the arm of the wooden rocker. I have to take this to Grandfather, his coat. She announced quickly, it's cold out there. Would you like to walk with me? The old girl and Highlander rose and followed as she opened the door and stepped outside. The moment the latch clicked free, Whisper was on his feet, padding silently through the door after them. They paused momentarily on the porch of the little cottage, losing themselves in the, in the splendour of the evening's peaceful, almost mystical still life. The air was chill and faintly damp and smelled sweetly of the darkened forest. White moonlight bathed the lawn, flower gardens neatly trimmed hedgerows and shrubs with dazzling brightness. Each blade of grass, soft petal and tiny leaf glistened wetly. Deep emerald lace with frost as the dew of the autumn evening gathered in the blackness beyond. The trees of the forest rose against the star-filled sky like monstrous giants, ageless, massive, frozen in the silence of the night. The gentle wind of the early dusk had faded entirely now, drifting soundlessly into stillness. Even the familiar cries of the woodland creatures had softened to faint, and distant murmurs had soothed and comforted. Grandfather will be at the willow, Kimber Bow said softly, breaking the spell. Together they moved off the porch and onto the walkway that led to the rear of the cottage. No one spoke a word. They simply walked slowly. The girl leading, their boots scraping softly against the worn stone. Something skittered through the dry leaves in the dark curtain of the forest and was gone. A bird, a bird called sharply, its piercing cry echoing in the stillness, lingering on. The three moved past the corner of the house now, through groups of pine and spruce and lines of hedgerow. Then with the huge sagging willow appeared from out of the darkness the edge of the forest. His branches trailing in thick streamers that hung like a curtain against the night, massive and gnarled. His humped form lay wrapped in shadowed darkness as if drawn inward onto itself. There beneath its canopied arch, the bowl of a pipe glowed deep red in the darkness, and puffs of smoke rose skyward to thin and vanish. As they passed through the trailing limbs of the willow, they saw clearly the skeletal form of Cockline hunched over on one pair of wooden benches that had been placed at the base of the ancient trunk. His wizened face turned toward the darkened forest. Kimberbo went directly over to him and placed the forest cloak about his shoulders. You'll catch cold, Grandfather, she scolded gently. The old man grimaced. Can't even come out here for a smoke without you overing over me like a mother hen. He pulled the cloak about him, nevertheless, as he glanced over at Brendan Roan. And I don't need these two for company either. Oh, that worthless cat. 
I suppose you brought him out here too. Bryn looked about for Whisper and was surprised to find that he had disappeared again. A moment earlier, he had been right behind them. Kimber seated herself next to her grandfather. Why won't you at least try to be friends with Bryn and Roan? She asked him quietly. <coughs> what for? The other snapped. I don't need friends. Friends are nothing but a trouble. Always expecting you to do something for them. Always wanting some favour or other. Had enough friends in the old days, girl. You don't understand enough about how life is. That's your trouble. The girl glanced apologetically and Bryn and Roan and nodded toward the empty bench. Word will see the veil girl and the Highlanders sat down across from her. Kimber Bow turned back to the old man. You must not be like that. You must not be so selfish. I'm an old man. I can be what I want, Cogline muttered petulantly. When I used to say things like that, you called me spoiled and sent me to my room. Do you remember? That was different. Should I send you to your room, she asked, speaking to the old man as a mother would do her child, her hands clasping his. Or perhaps you would prefer it if Whisper and I also had nothing more to do with you, since we are your friends too, and you do not seem to want any friends. Cogline clamped his teeth about the stem of his pipe as if he might bite it through, and hunched down sullenly within the cloak. Refusing to answer, Bryn glanced quickly over at Roan, who arched one eyebrow in response. It was clear to both that despite her age, it was Kimber Bow who had the stabilising force in this strange little family. The girl leaned over then and kissed her grandfather's cheek softly. I know you don't really believe what you said. I know you are a good, kind gentleman and I love you. She brought her arms about his thin frame and hugged him close. To Bryn's surprise, the old man's arms came tentatively and hugged her back. They should have asked before they came here, he muttered, gesturing vaguely toward the Vale Girl and the Highlander. I might have hurt them, you know. Yes, Grandfather, I know, the girl responded, but now they are here. After having made such a long journey to find you, I think you should see why it is that they have come. And if there is anything you can do to help them. Bryn and Roan exchanged hurried glances once more. Cogline slipped free of Kimber Bow's arms, muttering and shaking his head, whoopish hair dancing in the moon glow like fine silk thread. Dratted cat, where's he got to this time? Whisper, come out here, you worthless beast. I'm not sitting around. Grandfather? The girl interrupted him firmly. The old man looked at her in startled silence and she nodded toward Bryn and Roan. Our friends, Grandfather. Will you ask them? The wrinkles in the old man's face creased deeper as he frowned. Oh, very well, he huffed irritably. What is it that brought you here? We have needed someone who can show us the way through this country, Bryn replied at once hardly daring to hope that the help they so badly needed might not might at last be offered. We were told that Cogline was the man who might know that way, except that there isn't any Cogline, the oldster snapped, but a warning glance from the girl quieted him at once. Well then, what country is it that you plan to travel through? The central enough, Bryn answered, Darkland Reach, the moor beyond, all the way east of the Ravenshorn, she paused, into the male moor. But the walkers are there, Kimber Bow exclaimed. What reason would you have for going into that black pit? The old man followed up hastily. Bryn hesitated, seeing where matters were headed, to destroy the walkers. Destroy the walkers? Cogline was aghast. Destroy them with what, girl? With the wish song. With the magic that... With the wish song. With that singing? That's what you plan to use? Cogline was on his feet. 
leaping about wildly, skeletal arms gesturing, and you think me mud? Get out of here! Get out of my house! Get out! Go on, get out! Kimberbo rose and gently pulled the old man back down on the bench, talking to him, soothing him as he continued to rant. Took a few moments to quieten him. Then wrapping him once more in the forest cloak, she turned again to Brynham Road. Pronounce it, she addressed the Val girl solemnly, her face quite stern. The Mal Maud is no place for you. Even I do not go there. Brynham almost smiled at the other's emphasis for her own forbidding. But I do not have a choice in this, Kimber, she explained gently. I have to go. And I have to go with her, Roan added grudgingly. When I find the sword again, that is, I have to find the sword first. Kimber looked at them each in turn and shook her head in confusion. I don't understand. What sword? Why is it that you have to go into the Malmord? Why is it that you have to destroy the walkers? Again, Brisbane hesitated, the Simon caution. How much should she reveal of the quest that had brought her to this land? How much should she tell of the truth that had been entrusted to her? But as she looked into the eyes of Kimber, the caution that bade her kept watch over all that she could carefully hid suddenly ceased. To have meaning. Helenon was dead, gone forever from the Four Lands. The magic he had given Roan in order that he might protect her was lost. She was alone, weary and frightened, despite the term determination that carried her forward on this impossible journey. If she were to survive what lay ahead, she knew she must take what help she could find, where she might find it. Hidden truths and clever deceptions had been a way of life for Helenon, a part of the person that he had been. It could never be so for her. So she told the girl and the old man all that had been told to her and all that had befall befallen her since Elanon had first appeared in the village of Shady Vale. Those many days gone past. She had nothing of the truth, so those secrets she kept, had kept hidden even from her own. Those frightening suspicions and unpleasant whisperings of the powers, dark and unfathomable. Of the wish song. It took a long time to tell it all, but for once the old man was quiet and the girl listened with him in silent wonderment. When she had finished, she turned to Roan to see if there were anything further that should be said, but the Highlander shook his head wordlessly. You see then, that I have to go. She whispered the words one final time, looking from the girl to the old man and back again waiting. Elven magic. And you, eh? Coglone muttered. Eyes piercing. Druids touch on the whole of what you do. I have a bit of that touch myself, you know. A bit of the dark lore. Yes, yes, I do. Can we touch his arm gently? Can we help them find their Path east, Grandfather. East? All of the country east is known to me. All there is, here to there and back, Hearthstone, Duckland, each on the moor, all to the Ravenstone, all to the male moor. He shook his whippish head thoughtfully. Keep the touch I have. Walkers don't bother me here. Walkers don't come into the valley. Outside they go where they please to. That's their country. Grandfather, listen to me. She prodded him gently. We must help our friends, you and Whisper and I. Coglin looked at her wordlessly for a moment, then threw up his arms. Waste the time, he announced. Ridiculous waste of time. <coughs> his bony finger came up to touch the girl's nose. Have to think better than that, girl. I taught you to think better than that. Suppose we do help. Suppose we take these two right through Darkland Reach, right through Odin Moor, right to the Ravenshorn and the Black Pit. Suppose. What then? Tell me, what then? That would be enough, Prince started to reply. Enough? Coglan explained, cutting her short. Not nearly so, girl. 
Cliffs rise up before you, before you like a wall, hundreds of feet high, barren rock for miles. Gnomes everywhere. What happens then? What do you do then? The finger shifted like a dagger to point at her. No way in, girl. There's no way in. You cannot go all that distance unless you know a way in. We will find a way, Brenda assured him firmly. Bah! The old man spit grimacing. Walkers would have you in a moment. To see you coming halfway up the hill. If you can find a place to make the climb ladder. Or can the magic make you invisible? Can it do that? Bryn said her jaw. We will find a way, she repeated. Maybe, and maybe not. Bryn spoke up suddenly. I don't like the sound of it, Bryn. The old man knows the country. And if he says it's all open ground, <laughs> we ought to take that into account before we go charging in. He glanced at Coline as if to reassure himself that the old man did in fact know what he was talking about. Besides, first things first, before we start off on this track through the Eastland, we have to recover the sword. It's the only real protection we have against the walkers. There's no protection against the walkers, Cogline snorted. Prince stared at the Highlander for a moment, then took a deep breath. <sighs> Roan, we have to forget about the sword. She told him gently. It's gone and we have no way of finding what's become of it. Elanon said it would find its way again into human hands, but he did not say whose hands those would be. Nor did he say how long it would take for this to happen. We cannot Without a sword to protect us we don't have another we don't take another step. Rowan's jaw tightened as he cut short the rest of what Bryn was about to say. There was a long silence. We have no choice, Bryn said. At least I don't. On your way then, Cogline brushed them both aside with a wave of his hand. On your way and leave us in peace. You are your foolish plans of scaling the pit and destroying the walkers. Foolish, foolish plans. Go on, fly on out. Tra. Whisper. Where have you got to, you worthless? Show yourself, why! He shrieked in surprise as the big cat's head appeared from out of the darkness at his shoulder. Luminous eyes blinking, cold muzzle pressed right up against his bare arm. Furious at being surprised like that, Cogline swatted at the cat and stalked a dozen yards away beneath the willow boughs, swearing as he went. Whispers speared after him, then walked about the bench to lie down next to Kimber. I think that Grandfather can be persuaded to show you the way east, at least as far as the raven's horn, Kimber mused, thought thoughtfully, as to what you will do after that. Wait a minute, just let's think this through a moment, Roan held up his hands imploringly. He turned to Bryn. I know you have decided to complete this quest that Elanon has given you. I understand that you must, and I'm going with you, right to the end of it. But we have to have the sword, Bryn. Don't you see that? We have to. We have no other weapons to which to, to stand against the, the more race. His face tightened with frustration. For cat's sakes, how can I protect you without a sword? Bryn hesitated then, thinking suddenly of the power of the wish song and what she had seen that power do to those men from West Fanning Ridge at the Rooker Line Trading Centre. Rowan did not know, nor did she want him to. But power such as that was more weapon than she cared to think. And she loathed the very idea that it could live within her. Rowan was so certain that she must regain the use of the power of the sword of Lee, but she sensed somehow that, as with the magic of the wish song and the magic of the elf stones before it, the magic of the sword of Lee was both light and dark at once. That could cause harm to the user as well as give a maid. She looked at Roan, seeing in his grey eyes the love he bore for her, mingled with the certainty that he could not help her without that magic. Elanon had given him. That look was desperate, yet without understanding of what he asked. 
There is no way for us to find the sword run, she said softly. They faced each other wordlessly, seated close upon the wooden bench, lost in the shadow dark of the old willow. Let it go, Bryn prayed silently. Please let it go. Cogline shambled back to join them, still muttering at whisper as he squatted wearily on one end of the bench and began fiddling with his pipe. There might be a way, Kimber said suddenly, her voice, her small voice breaking through the silence. All eyes turned toward her. We could ask the Grimpond. Ah! Cogline snorted. Might as well ask a hole in the ground. Barone sat forward at once. What is the Grimpond? An avatar, the girl answered quietly. A shade that lives in a pool of water north of Hearthstone, with a high ridges part. It has always lived there. It, it tells me since before the destruction of the old world, since the time of the world of fairy. It has the magic of the old world in its touch, and the sight to see secrets hidden from living people. It could tell me where to find the sword. Roan pressed anxiously, ignoring the restraining hand that Bryn placed upon his arm. Ah, ah, look at him, Cogline cackled gleefully. Thinks he has the answer now, doesn't he? Thinks he's found a way. The grimp on his secrets of the earth all bound up in a pretty package, ready to give to him. Just a little problem of telling truth from lie, that's all. Ha, <laughs> ha. What's he talking about? Roan demanded angrily. What does he mean, truth from lie? Kimber gave her grandfather a stern look to quieten him, then turned back to the Highlander. He means that the Avatar doesn't always tell the truth. It lies much of the time, or tells riddles that no one can figure out. It's a game out of it. Twisting what is real and what is not so, that the listener cannot decide what to believe. But why does he do that? Bryn asked, bewildered. The girl shrugged. Shades are like that. They drew drift between the world that was and the one that will be and have no real place in either. She said it with such authority that the Veil Girl accepted what she said without questioning it further. Besides, it has been that way with the Shade of Bremen as well, in part at least. There was a sense of commitment in the Shade of Bremen, lacking perhaps in the Grimpon. But the Shade of Bremen did not tell all or what it knew or speak clearly of what would be. Some of the truth could never be told. The whole of the future was never unalterably fixed. And the telling of it must always be shaded by what might yet be. Grandfather prefers that I have nothing to do with the Grimpon, Kimberbo was explaining to Roan. He does not approve of the way the Avatar lies. Still, his conversation is amusing sometimes. And it becomes an interesting game for me when I choose to play it. She assumed a stern look. Of course, it is a different kind of game entirely when you try to commit the avatar to telling you the truth or what it knows when it is really important to you. I never ask it of the future or listen to what it has to say if it offers to tell me. It is a cruel cool thing sometimes. Roan looked down momentarily, then up again at the girl. Do you think it could be made to tell me what has happened to my sword? Kimber's eyebrows lifted. Not made. Persuaded, perhaps. Tricked, maybe. She looked at Bryn. But I was just not thinking of finding the sword. I was thinking as well of finding a way into the Raven's Horn and into the Malmord. If there were a way by which the walkers could not see you coming, the Grimpon would know it. There was a long, anxious silence. Bryn answered mine raced away into the Malmord that would hide them from the Maud race. It was the key that she needed in order to complete the quest for the old edge. She would be she would have preferred the sort of leave with its magic and its power remain lost. But what matter that it was found again if it need not be used? She glanced at Roan and saw the determination in his eyes. The matter was already decided for him. We must try it, Bryn, he said softly. Cogline's wrinkled split, face split wide in the leering grin. Go on, Highlander. Go on, Southlander. 
try it. His soft laughter echoed through the night stillness. Bryn hesitated. At her feet stretched between the benches of his grey black body cooled close to his mistress. Whisper raised his massive head and blinked curiously. The veil girl stared deep into the cat's source of blue eyes. How desperate she had become that she must turn to the aid of a wood girl, a half-crazed old man, and a cat that disappeared. But Eleanor was gone. Would you speak to the Grimpon for us? she asked Kimber. The girl smil smiled brightly. Oh, I was thinking, Bryn, that it might be better if you who spoke to the, if it was you who spoke to the Grimpon. And it was then that Coglan really began to cackle. 